Okay. Uh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Larson. I'm the Director of Government Relations. So welcome. It's great to see everybody here. Um, I just wanted to say a few words before we got started. Um, unfortunately, Terrace, uh, Director Smith is not going to be able to join us today. She's not fearing very well. So, uh, so you've got me representing her instead. So. So last week, DES released a final environmental impact statement that answers the question to this, what the state has grappled with for decades, how to, band, excuse me, how to better manage the Capital Lake Deschutes Estuary. The EIS, answer, excuse me, the EIS answers this question using science and stakeholder input. The EIS identifies the estuary as the preferred alternative for long-term management. <laughs> this is an important milestone for the state and the community. Environmental conditions in the Deschutes West Estuary have been getting worse for decades, and they will continue in that direction until we act. I am thankful for the collaboration that brings us to this answer. It started a few years ago before the EIS process began. In 2016, DES worked with each of you as a key partner in the advisory groups to identify project goals and that the EIS was the path to the answer. Without the EIS, the state could not move forward with a strategy or even a short-term actions like dredging. We would not be here today without amazing partnerships, partnerships that will continue in the future under the recent MOU for shared funding and governance for the estuary alternative. As, after construction, the MOU provides funding for dredging through 2050. This supports a working waterfront and enhanced community use like recreational boating and boardwalks that people can stroll along. We completed the MOU because of your beliefs in the importance of this project. This is a powerful example of what we can accomplish together, especially when the state works in collaboration with tribal governments and local communities. I would like to thank each of you who partnered on the executive work group and funding and governance work group for engaging with us over the past few years and for also actively engaging in the EIS process. We would not be here without your participation in this process. Um, and let me see, I don't believe we have any legislators, Carrie, but... Yeah, it's I'm trying to look here too at the. All right. I don't think so. I'm going to pass it back to you, Carrie. But again, I just want to thank you all for being here today. This is an exciting milestone, and we're all happy to be here. Thank you, Ann. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we'll do um, some introductions um, to start off. I'm Carrie Martin, environmental planner with DES, and I've been the state's lead on the EIS. Um, let's go through our team first, and then um, in case we have some members of the public watching, or um, since we'll be, or we are recording this, we'll, let's do a round of introductions so, so that everyone knows who everyone is. So um, let's see, Bill, would you like to introduce yourself? We'll go through our team first. I'm Bill Ferrari, and I am the Assistant Director for Facility Professional Services at the Department of Enterprise Services, and uh, um, we, we helped to bring this through to fruition, so thank you. Um, Chris Ferguson? Uh, Chris Ferguson, Government Relations Coordinator with DES, working with uh, Ann Larson. Tessa? Hi, nice to see you all again. My name is Tessa Gardner brown Senior Environmental Planner and Associate Principal at Floyd Snyder and the Consultant Team Project Manager. Dave. Hi, uh, Dave Merchant, Assistant Attorney General. I'm happy to assist this project. Carmen. Hi, Carmen Martin, Senior Environmental Planner with Environmental Science Associates, or ESA, and I've been serving as the EIS lead on the consultant side. Kristen? Hi, I'm Kristen Legg with Floyd Snyder and I've been assisting with public outreach. Kim? I'm Kim Mahoney, I'm with Floyd Snyder, I'm an environmental planner and I've been helping with the EIS and with working group outreach. And Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Rich with Echo Northwest and we, uh, <clears throat> we're the lead on the economic analysis for the EIS and have been facilitating the funding and governance work group with Tessa. Great. Um, let's see. Um, looks like we have uh, Representative Theringer joining us. Uh, we're just doing some introductions. Welcome. Uh, hello, uh, Representative Theringer, Chair of the Capital Budget in the House. Glad to have you here. Pleasure. 
Okay, let's see. Um, trying to look and see who we have from our executive work group. Um, let's see. Um, Mayor Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Debbie Sullivan, Mayor of the City of Tumwater. And Council Member Althauser. Hi, Michael Althauser. I am a council member with the City of Tumwater. Happy to be here. Right. And let me see here. I think um, representing um, Commissioner Menser, Thomasina. Good morning, everyone. Thomasina Cooper on behalf of Commissioner Menser, who is out ill today. Thank you. And let's see, now we'll go to our funding and governance members. Um, Justin. Hi, I'm Justin Long. I'm the finance director at Lock Clean Water Alliance. Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Canelli, assistant executive director at Lock Clean Water Alliance. Rich. Uh, good morning, everyone. Rich Hoy, Interim Assistant City Manager for City of Olympia. Jay. Good morning, Jay Bernie, City Manager, City of Olympia. Let's see, John. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. John Down, City Administrator for Tumwater. Sam. Morning, Sam Gibney, Executive Director, Port of Olympia. And uh, Jeff. Good morning. Jeff Yadman, Thurston County Treasurer, and it's good to see you, Bill. I haven't seen you in a while. And Alex. Hi, Alex Smith with the Department of Natural Resources, Deputy Supervisor for Forest Resilience, Regulation, and Aquatic Resources. Thanks. Great. Okay, and have I missed anyone here? Okay. Let's see, well, um, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I will, why don't we get our slides started? Go through the agenda. Okay. All right, so we will be um, going through uh, the description of our preferred alternatives, um, highlighting some of our key findings and updates in the final EIS. Uh, we will be talking about the Memorandum of Understanding for Shared Funding and Governance. And we know there may be questions and um, uh, special interest about the memorandum of understanding. So know that we will get to that and have plenty of time for any uh, questions when we get to that agenda item. We'll talk about what comes next, our next phases, and we will save time for any closing comments from the work group members um, when we get to that point. Um, since this will be our final uh, work group meeting, we wanted to make sure we left some time if you have any comments at the end. And as always, we'll have some time for public comments. Okay, so I think with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? Thank you, Carrie. All right, so um, uh, the first item on this list, we wanted to go through some noteworthy items is this meeting. And um, it might seem odd that we are describing this as a noteworthy item, but we have given this presentation to the community sounding board on Tuesday of last week and the technical work group on Wednesday of last week. And our goal has been in these presentations to provide the same um, the same material and the same content. So we are ensuring that everybody has a common understanding of the key information to be shared at the final EIS. And so we wanted to let folks know that we were meeting with you today and that the meeting would be recorded and posted to the website. And thank you all for meeting with us this morning. We know much of the content is going to be content that you're familiar with, given our close work over the last year. But we do think um, we will be sharing some additional updates. And um, at the end of each of our speaking segments, there's opportunity for questions. So please do, if you have questions that can help you convey this information more broadly, um, or just to help your understanding, please go ahead and make sure we get those answered for you. 
And um, the EAS is available on the project website that went up last Monday morning. We're so happy to have the final EAS issued. And uh, part of the presentation today is to help folks understand where they can go in that big document for additional learning. And so at the bottom of each slide for the rest of the presentation, you'll see on the bottom left, there will be a, a learn more and it'll point you to where you can go find more information in the final EIS. And then the last thing that's important for us to, to describe here is that um, the State Environmental Policy Act does not include a public comment period after the final EIS, but we do want to let you know that we have responded to every comment that we received on the draft EIS during its public comment period. And our responses to those comments can be found in attachment 22 of the final EIS. There's about a thousand pages of information, good information there. Okay. Um, with that, let me go ahead and dive into our first segment. I have about six or seven slides and then we'll stop for questions. Um, Enterprise Services has formally identified the estuary alternative as the preferred alternative for long-term management. And this group especially has had a good understanding that the estuary alternative was the likely preferred alternative. But in that initial presentation of material earlier this year, we uh, maintained a commitment to confirm that and, and really to ensure that we were maintaining an objective analysis throughout the completion of the final EIS and um, based on our work with the funding and governance work group. And we have done that and the outcome has been confirmed that the estuary alternative is the preferred alternative and, and that is confirmed in the final EIS. And so given that, in this segment, we want to describe components of the alternative to make sure that you all have a good understanding of the project elements and have an opportunity to ask any clarifying questions. And again, this will be uh, recorded. And so some of the goal too is to help this be a, a good report out that other folks in the community can reference. And we also wanted to describe the maintenance dredging that would occur after construction. It's such an important uh, management commitment for this alternative. And then we'll touch briefly on the process for how the preferred alternative was identified and confirmed. And okay. So the estuary alternative, it will construct a new bridge at Fifth Avenue, and that new bridge will include a vehicle lane, a bike lane, and a sidewalk in each direction. And that new bridge would be constructed before demolition of the existing Fifth Avenue dam and bridge. And the purpose of that is so that traffic and pedestrians can continue through and around the existing corridor during construction. Um, and Carmen will speak more on, on those improvements to the alternative later in the presentation. And during construction, dredging would remove more than 500,000 cubic yards of sediment that have accumulated in the Capitol Lake Basin since the last dredge event, which was in 1986. And that Dredging during construction is important for a couple of reasons. One, it minimizes the amount of sediment that would move downstream after removal of the Fifth Avenue Dam. And because we will beneficially reuse most of that sediment within the basin to create new shoreline habitat areas. And with that sediment, approximately 85 acres of shoreline marsh habitat would be established and planted. And that is intended to create a diverse ecological and visual environment along the shoreline. And in addition to those shoreline habitat areas, the estuary alternative would restore more than 150 acres of tidal flats. And let's see, in the middle and south basins, boardwalks would be constructed along the shorelines within and around those habitat areas that, that's um, depicted by the kind of the thin brown line. Um, there would be more than or about a mile of new boardwalk constructed. And there would be a, a hand carried boat launch established in Marathon Park for kayaks, paddle boards and other watercraft. And then, of course, toward the end of construction, the Fifth Avenue Dam would be removed and tidal hydrology would be restored to the basin. 
And with that um, restored tidal hydrology, the tidal levels within the basin would rise and fall throughout the day. And we have looked at, um, at this and on average, over a calendar year, we anticipate that there would be some level of standing water within that North Basin about 80% of the time. And then the last component that you all, all are very familiar with, um, after construction, maintenance dredging would occur in West Bay. And we'll talk about that now more on the next slide. Okay. So the estuary includes maintenance dredging in the deeper navigational areas of West Bay after construction. And um, <clears throat> maintenance dredging is proposed as, as you know, to ensure the vibrant waterfront with recreational boating and the Port of Olympia can be maintained. And the dredging areas are depicted by um, the colored areas on the Eastern shoreline of West Bay as shown here in this figure and dredging would not occur in the restored basin or along the western shoreline of West Bay. And um, we think it's important to note that through our coordination with the marinas and the Port of Olympia and the EIS process, we understood that significant impacts would occur from sediment deposition if more than 10% of least vessel slips at any one marina were impacted and or if vessels calling at the port had to wait for more than four hours for access. And so the estuary alternative includes dredging at a frequency to stay below those thresholds. Our hydrodynamic and sediment transport numerical modeling suggests that that could mean dredging would occur at a six year frequency at the Olympia Yacht Club and then a 12-year frequency at the other marinas and the port, and an 18-year frequency for the access area, which is shown in orange. And the last note here is that um, because of sediment accumulation is influenced by actual environmental conditions, so high flow years mean more sediment, there would be sediment monitoring at least annually in West Bay so that dredging could be adapted to those conditions and the frequency could be adjusted if needed. Okay, so um, historical dredging. We have found this photo to be very helpful for our context. It's an aerial photo that was um, taken in 1927 before the Fifth Avenue Dam was constructed. You can see the Port of Olympia off in the distance, uh, referred to number one there. The port was established in its current location in the 1920s. And Olympia Yacht Club is shown in the middle of the figure with the number two. It was established in its location in 1906. And for decades before the Fifth Avenue Dam was constructed in the 50s, the US Army Corps of Engineers conducted maintenance dredging to support, to support these navigational uses in the Deschutes estuary. And the dredging that is proposed after construction is not altogether different than the dredging that occurred historically here. It is really the most common approach to maintaining navigational uses in a um, dynamic waterfront environments. We should note too that we, um, get questions often about our coordination with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and we can confirm that Enterprise Services has coordinated with the Corps as part of the EIS process in technical meetings um, when the alternatives were being developed in response to comments we received on the draft EIS as we were developing the final EIS, and that coordination would continue into design and permitting. Okay, so these visual simulations show the tidal ranges that would occur in the North Basin after the tidal hydrology is reintroduced. And as I mentioned on the earlier slide, there would be standing water in the North Basin about 80% of the time if you average it out over the course of a calendar year. And I just want to call attention also to the planted areas. Those are the shoreline um, habitat areas that would be constructed from the dredge sediment, about 85 acres in total in the project area. 
Okay. Okay, decision-making process. I have just three quick slides here. Um, I'm sure you all remember this flowchart. We've gone over it in several meetings. We're not gonna go over it in detail again today, but um, we did want to describe that the purpose of the flowchart was to convey the steps um, that were taken to identify the preferred alternative and really to increase the transparency in that process. And the six boxes that are also on this slide represent the criteria that Enterprise Services and the EIS project team evaluated the long-term management alternatives against. And that evaluation relied on technical findings from the EIS, and it included a range of sub-criteria for each of these that were numerically scored. And here is where I just pause and say, we have provided all of that information in attachment 21. I would encourage you, if you have interest in the key findings from that evaluation, that alternatives evaluation, please do head over to attachment 21. It's linked on our website. There's a lot of good information in there. Um, and then you will also remember, of course, that Enterprise Services built in stakeholder feedback into the decision making process, and we refer to that as decision durability, the six box there. And that is intended to represent the ability of the long term management alternatives to achieve long term support from communities, stakeholders and tribes, and I'll go, th go through the um, results of that evaluation as well. Okay. so. This slide presents the outcome of the alternatives and uh, of the alternatives evaluation, excuse me. And it is as high level as we could possibly make it. There is so much detail here that is not shown on this slide, but we still do think it's helpful to show because what you can see um, when everything is averaged up, when the whole alternatives evaluation is averaged up, the pretty significant delta that exists between the SRA score and the score for the other long-term management alternatives. So we wanted to show that to you here. Um, I The other key thing that we wanted to relay is that you remember we um, last year went through an exercise, a pairwise exercise, where we asked for your feedback on whether the um, decision-making criteria should be weighted or prioritized. And we, at the end of the alternatives evaluation, we ran a sensitivity test on this scoring with the rating with the weighting recommendations that were provided by the executive technical work groups and the community sounding boards and ultimately none of the weighting schemes would change the outcome. Okay. So my last slide here, this slide shows to you the numeric feedback that we received from the stakeholders regarding the ability of the alternatives to achieve long-term support. And narrative responses uh, were also provided by, by you all, by the stakeholders, and were reviewed during the decision-making process. We thought those were very helpful, and so we elected to include them in attachment 21 for transparency. And um, you can see again here that there is a significant delta between the estuary alternative and the scoring for the other alternatives. The last thing that I'll note um, is about the scoring provided by the Squaxin Island tribe. The feedback that we received um, at that time was that the only alternative they support is the estuary alternative, and therefore they did not provide a numeric score for the other alternatives. That falsely skews the summary score on the higher end for the other long-term management alternatives, so we just want to point that out, um, that those would otherwise be lower if we had received, like, for example, a one score from the Squaxin Island tribe. Okay. Pausing here, yeah. any questions on the estuary alternative, its components, how we arrived to that outcome? All right, thank you all. I'll pass it off to Carmen. But Tessa, I just got a quick question. <laughs> sure, Jeff. So uh, has Tacoma Rail 
made any comment during any of this period because they do have that short bridge that goes over the middle of the basin. Has BNSF made a comment? I thought that was Tacoma Rail. Oh, um, there are two rail lines in the basin and I could, I'd have to go back to see which one the, the, the bridge is owned by. We have reached out to both of the rail entities during scoping at the draft EIS and at the final EIS. We haven't received anything in response, but we have, um, actively reached out to them and and so um they have been notified of the project and the last thing that i'll say is that there would not be an impact to that bridge or its operations as a result of the project yeah i didn't think there would be and that was actually that was more of a curiosity question than anything else definitely that would be some coordination certainly that's forecasted in the design and permitting process Okay. okay, over to you, Carmen. All right, thank you, Tessa. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking to the key findings and updates that you'll find in the final EIS. I'll start by describing some important modifications made to the alternatives. Then I'll summarize the top five discipline specific updates. And I'll note here that most, if not all of the key updates that were made in the EIS are directly in response to comments received on the draft EIS. Okay, so there are two main changes to the alternatives that were made in response to comments. The first involving both the estuary and hybrid alternatives and the second is specific to the hybrid alternative. As you recall, both the estuary and hybrid alternatives have in common removal of the existing Fifth Avenue Dam and Bridge and replacement with a new Fifth Avenue Bridge. In the draft EIS, this replacement was going to occur in the same alignment as the existing bridge, and it would have meant a long-term closure of Fifth Avenue of four to five years to allow for roadway realignment, removal of the existing earthen dam, and reconstruction of the new Fifth Avenue Bridge. In response to comments, as well as concerns of stakeholders over this long-term closure, Enterprise Services and the EIS team met with City of Olympia staff in a series of workshops to review potential solutions that could avoid this long-term closure. And through this collaboration, a new revised Fifth Avenue design was identified and brought into the final EIS that is able to avoid this long-term closure. This revised design is shown at a very conceptual level here in this graphic. You can see the new Fifth Avenue Bridge would be constructed to the south of the existing bridge alignment, which allows it to be constructed before a demo of the Fifth Avenue Dam and Bridge. It would be connected to the roadway on either side of the water body. On the east end of the new alignment, it would connect to Deschutes Parkway at a new roundabout. And as Tessa noted, the new bridge would serve both vehicular um, traffic and have separated facilities for non-motorized traffic. So this change is reflected in the analysis of impacts, which was updated throughout the final EIS, in particular in the transportation section and the public services and utilities section Previous findings of significant impacts were able to be reduced to less than significant with elimination of this long-term closure. As you recall, the hybrid alternative is distinguished from the estuary alternative by the inclusion of a 45-acre reflecting pool adjacent to Heritage Park. The draft EIS analyzed both saltwater and freshwater reflecting pools as potential options based on comments Enterprise Services and the EIS team took a closer look at these options, and it was found that with adaptive management to maintain water quality, a groundwater, groundwater fed freshwater pool would have better conditions over saltwater reflecting pool. As a result, Enterprise Services revised the hybrid alternative to consider only a freshwater reflecting pool, and this update was also made throughout the final EIS. Next slide. So the next two slides list the top five discipline specific updates that I'll go over briefly. These are in addition to the updates that were made related to the, to the revised Fifth Avenue bridge design. 
So related to navigation, there are a number of comments asking what would happen if maintenance dredging is delayed or not completed in West Bay under the estuarine hybrid alternatives, whether it be due to funding lapses or other reasons. You know, maintenance dredging and monitoring of sediment are of course key design and mitigation measures included with these alternatives to avoid significant impacts. Additional modeling was completed for the final EIS to look at the scenario of possible delayed maintenance dredging. Based on modeling, if there was no maintenance dredging at all, there would be an incremental increase in impacts over time with the analysis estimating that about 50% of the slips at Olympia Yacht Club and 25% of slips at other marinas would be impacted in 30 years. Under the hybrid alternative, the level of anticipated impact would be slightly higher. There would also be increased wait times for larger, heavier commercial vessels calling up the Port of Olympia's south berth. For the water quality analysis, a regulatory compliance section was added based on modeling done by Ecology and the draft TMDL for Bud Inlet that Ecology issued last June. Just a quick side note to recognize here that the final TMDL for Bud Inlet was issued by Ecology last week, and the allocations described for Capital Lake uh, remain unchanged between the draft and the final. So this added regulatory compliance section in the final EIS describes water quality standards attainment and TMDL requirements for each alternative as viewed by Ecology. As noted here in this slide, Ecology has found that the estuary is the only alternative that can meet state water quality standards. Because the waste load allocations for lot and other discharges are set by Ecology based on the assumption that Capital Lake meets water quality standards under estuary conditions, that means that responsibilities could shift to lot and other dischargers under the other alternatives, so under the no action, the managed lake or the hybrid alternative. And as described in the final EIS, this could mean providing additional treatment or it could mean implementing improvements earlier than planned. In response to comments on the draft EIS, a New Zealand mud snail survey was completed and bud inlet last spring and the results were included in the final EIS. No mud snails were found, and this was an important finding considering that mud snails have been transported through the Fifth Avenue Dam since at least 2009 when they were first detected in Capitol Lake. The cultural resource section has been updated to reflect determinations of eligibility received from, from DAP or, or Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation subsequent to the draft EIS issuance. Notably here, DAP determined that Capital Lake, which was also referred to as the Deschutes Basin Project in the EIS, is not eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. The final EIS analysis and findings have been updated accordingly, and in response to comments, additional information has been included in the final EIS and in the Cultural Resources Discipline Report to describe the pre-contact era and indigenous use context in the study area. For Fish and Wildlife, in response to comments from CLIPA, also known as the Capital Lake Improvement and Protection Association, the EIS team completed a detailed review of studies cited in their comments related to salmon habitat, <coughs> excuse me, habitat growth and predation. Those were summarized in an annotated bibliography that was attached to the Fish and Wildlife Discipline Report. The EIS team also met with fishery staff from WDFW during development of the bibliography. Um, similarly, in response to comments on potential impacts to local bat populations, the EIS team met, met with WDFW staff and a local bat expert to review relevant studies, and those were also summarized in an annotated bibliography. The final EIS includes updates related to these reviews and also includes a new mitigation measure to coordinate with wildlife experts during the design phase to identify opportunities to, to support bat populations. <clears throat> okay, um, this slide is just a reminder that a broad range of environmental disciplines were evaluated in the EIS. 
There were a number of other updates made, made throughout the final EIS related to these disciplines. And if you're interested, I encourage you to look at the last table of the final EIS summary. This includes a listing of notable revisions made throughout the final EIS and the attached discipline reports. And with that, uh, any questions? <laughs> Okay, if not, I think we can continue on. All right. So we know that you all are very familiar with this part of the presentation, but as Tessa referenced earlier, we're trying to keep things consistent across the three presentations and for the benefit of our uh, those who come back and watch the video later. So I'm going to run through uh, where we landed on the memorandum of understanding for shared funding and governance. And there will be time afterwards for questions or other thoughts to add in. Um, so can go on to the next slide, please. So the legislature directed that this process explore options for long-term shared governance and funding among the local, state, and federal entities. And in 2016, the Funding and Governance Workgroup convened with representatives from eight entities, which are listed here on the right. There are um, five uh, local entities, City of Olympia, Tumwater, Lot, um, the Port and Thurston County, there's the tribe, and two state agencies. So in response to this call, the EIS also contains a memorandum of understanding that details the plan the Funding and Governance work group has developed to address funding and responsibility for project maintenance and sediment management under the estuary alternative. This is a non-binding document, which is signed by all entities of the Funding and Governance work group, and it is intended to bridge toward a binding interlocal agreement. It importantly, it signals to the legislature that the local support or the local support for achieving this project um, and the benefits that it would uh, produce uh, as um, and the group's uh, willingness to move forward with the process. Move forward to the next slide. So as you may recall, the funding and governance group recommended in the DEIS that construction funding would be the state's responsibility. This recommendation was consistent with one of the group's guiding principles that those who contributed to the problem uh, would share in funding. After the selection of the likely preferred alternative, the group reconvened, this was last spring, to discuss funding and governance of long-term maintenance under the uh, estuary alternative specifically. And this discussion centered around a second guiding principle that those who benefit from the project would also share in funding. So the funding and governance work group spent a lot of time thinking about these benefits, um, how they uh, came from the project, would come from the project and would um, produce a stream of benefits over time. And they identified that the project would provide local and statewide benefits in multiple ways. Some of these are, are listed on the slide here um, that uh, would have come from both implementing the estuary alternative and by providing support for that long-term maintenance and sediment management component that Tessa spoke about at the beginning. Um, a clearly defined responsibility and a stable funding stream for managing sediment in particular is key to maintaining the working waterfront and the recreational boating in West Bay. So by addressing the uncertainties around that Manage, resp management responsibility and the funding, the memorandum of understanding is an essential step towards ensuring the durability and the sustainability of the estuary alternative. Go on to the next slide. So in exploring the governance options, the funding and governance work group determined that many of the project features did not need a centralized governance um, structure, and instead that the entities most closely related to the specific project functions and assets could most efficiently handle that long-term maintenance. So rather than creating a whole new entity, which would require its own staffing and, and its own amount of overhead funding, um, they elected to, um, to break up these different functions. And so, for example, 
the city of Olympia after construction um, would take over ownership and responsibility for long-term maintenance of the Fifth Avenue Bridge. The city of Tumwater, um, as another example, would take over the South Basin boardwalks, which are adjacent to the Tumwater Historic Park. The state would take on responsibility for recreational infrastructure and the Middle Basin boardwalks, which are adjacent to the Capitol Campus area, as well as managing the functions critical to the sediment management outside of the port jurisdiction in West Bay. So that would be in the jurisdiction or in the areas of the private marinas and some of the, the public moorage. The port would, oh, and that includes um, bathymetric surveys, design and permitting, and the contract management for dredging. It does not include the funding for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. The port would retain these functions and its vessel berths, and it would lead coordination with the Corps for dredging in the Federal Navigation Channel. Um, the tribe would have participation, uh, uh, ongoing participation in the Habitat Enhancement Plan. And I think that covers the slide. So the final piece that the funding and governance work group addressed was the funding for sediment management. All of the other potential long-term funding needs were taken care of by that asset transfer and responsibility transfer. Um, the memorandum of understanding includes the proposed funding allocation for sediment management, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, the, the funding would provide certainty for sediment management through 2050. So this agree agreement would um, last through 2050, and that, that period was chosen because it coincides with the term, uh, the expiration of the leases at the private marinas in West Bay. That creating that time frame um, and a definite time frame to discuss within this memorandum of understanding, consider allowed um, the entities who were involved um, to manage some of the uncertainty about, about what conditions might look like in the future. It doesn't say that none of these actions would occur after 2050 necessarily, but it does um, require that the entities before 2050 reconvene to determine a plan beyond that time frame. Um, so the MOU also stipulates that the marinas would provide funding equivalent to the cost of dredging in their areas under the no action alternative, because we know that there have been there have been ongoing dredging costs and those would continue to be the responsibility of the entities who would need to take care of them now. Um, the funding allocation is based on um, and reflects the, um, the discussion of how benefits would accrue um, with that sediment management activity. And ultimately the allocation um, that the, the is presented in the MOU um, is that the um, most of the entities uh, would divide the funding responsibility equally. Um, the city of Olympia equally, and it would be about 15% um, to each entity for the um, for that equal portion. The city of Olympia, which is closest to um, the uh, the benefits that accrue from the uh, working waterfront and the recreational boating in West Bay um, would take on a slightly higher proportion of that funding at 23%. And the tribe would not have funding responsibility for that. Again, they are taking on some um, participation in the Habitat Enhancement Plan, so some of that responsibility and management going forward, but there is no funding component um, because of the equity considerations here. So. Uh, in summary, the Memorandum of Understanding lays out the areas of conceptual agreement among the funding and governance members that the funding and governance members have identified to date. And it serves as a bridging document toward that interlocal agreement, which would be binding. And progress toward that will continue on in the coming year. So I'll take questions now or any other thoughts that people want, people want to offer since you all have been involved in this process. Okay, well, there'll be more time later for comments. Carrie? So 
sorry, unmute myself. All right, thank you. Um, so now we'll do a, a look at the next project phases and what's next. So if you can move the slide forward. Okay, so the EI, final EIS is complete. So what's next? Um, on our graphic here, you can see we are currently at the orange arrow, November of 2022 following the completion of the final EIS. So if funded, design and permitting would be the next step, estimated to take three to five years. During that time, the conceptual design that was developed during the EIS process would move to final design, while DES applied for federal, state, and local permits. Um, Enterprise Services is committed to continued stakeholder engagement throughout the design process, um, there would be work certainly with each of the permitting agencies, and there would also be close stakeholder coordination on the project components. Uh, for example, with the City of Olympia on the new Fifth Avenue Bridge to make sure we understood their requirements and also to include public input, uh, similar to what was done when the Fourth Avenue Bridge was replaced. Uh, during the design phase, more precise cost estimates would also be developed as design progressed. You can move to the next slide. Okay, so construction, estuary restoration. The primary responsibility for construction funding would be with the state. However, once design and permitting was funded, enterprise services could move act, could actively pursue federal funding opportunities uh, from a variety of sources for the construction along with potential state and local grant monies. Um, Anne, would you like to um, add anything here? Um, yeah, so I think um, what's important to know is we're looking right now at different um, options available to make a diversified capital stack. And so once we get through design and permitting, um, we'll be able to uh, capitalize on that and, and look to our congressional partners, um, the tribes and others to see um, how we can have that diversified funding as we move into construction. And that's going to be really critical. Um, I know we have one of our budget writers on the state, but I think the message is to, to our state capital budget writers is we are looking for other ways to bite on the cost of construction that isn't going to fall solely on the, the state as a responsible um, to pay for that. So I think Thanks, Anne. Mm -hmm. um, See, and um, I guess the one thing I would add to that is the sooner we can pursue this, the more opportunities would likely be available. So um, we're excited to get started with that. Uh, finally, construction could take up to eight years and it's expected to happen after the port led sediment cleanup in West Bay. Okay, we can go to the next slide. All right, um, we've found this graphic to be um, really helpful to show how the various pieces of the work lay out. Uh, DES led estuary restora restoration is in green, broken down between completion of the final EIS, design and permitting and construction. The port led sediment remediation in West Bay is shown in blue. Uh, from our coordination with the port, we understand that they're beginning design work now and could start the cleanup as early as 2025 or 2026. These estimated timelines anticipate completion of the remediation before the dam is removed. Um, and you can see on the graphic, dam removal is shown as the two stars that show the earliest and latest estimates for when the dam would come out and estuary conditions would be restored. This is also when sediment deposition in West Bay would increase over existing rates to levels more consistent with pre-dam conditions. And so then finally in brown, you can see the maintenance dredging that would need to occur in West Bay at approximately six year intervals once the dam was removed and increased sediment began to flow into Bud Inlet. There would be annual bathymetric surveys to monitor the deposition to allow dredging to take place when needed. And the extra dredging, dredging would be funded by the Funding and Governance Work Group as uh, Sarah described uh, about the, the MOU. So are there any questions on next steps or on the timeline?
Uh, I guess I had one, Terry. Um, so it looks like uh, the process would be to pursue funding for design and permitting in this upcoming legislative session. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, just to, uh, curious about how, you know, um, we all might be helpful uh, in that process. Is there any thoughts you have at this point? Anne, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> I have all kinds of thoughts. Great question. <laughs> So we have right now our budget request in for design and permitting with the governor's office and OFM. So they'll be reviewing that. And when the budget comes out in December, we'll know um, whether or not um, that's been um, going to be funded. So I think letters of support would be helpful uh, to the governor's office and OFM. If it did, does get funded in the governor's budget, then it would move to the legislature. And we have folks like uh, Representative Theringer and others who have a great interest in this and then showing your support through the legislative uh, session, this upcoming session would be also very helpful too. So um, yeah, I'm gonna lean on all the partners here around the table um, to show that um, this has just been a very collaborative process and that we have some strong support for the estuary as we move forward. And that also the new do nothing is not an option at this point. So thank you for that question. So along with what you just said, and thank you, <clears throat> all of us that have worked so hard on this are more than ready to make ourselves av available for committee testimony if it comes to that. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. The fun part begins. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, let's move ahead then. All right. So now we wanted to provide the opportunity if any of you would like to make any closing comments or share any thoughts, um, I'll just go around and you can say something or not. Um, but given this is the closing out of the process, we wanted to, to offer that opportunity. Um, why don't we start? Um, Representative Steele, is there anything you would like to, to say or comment on? Theron, I think it's Representative. So I'm so sorry. Okay. Representative Theringer. Uh, well, you know, amazing amount of work, right? It's been going on for a few years now. Um, and as the IAS finally asks, you know, gives us a pathway to solving this problem that's been around for decades. Um, looking at the timeline on moving forward, I mean, it's an extended timeline. And so I think you have to look at the funding, certainly at the state level is extended, right? So um, I think the coordination between, for example, the request for design at this point for the estuary, and how that relates to the dredging that the port's going to pursue and what happens with my understanding, you know, the Matka listing and all that. That to me, getting the dredging done and getting that process done is the first major step, right? And depending on how the budget looks, whether we provide design money at this point um, seems a little bit dependent on how that timing goes for the dredging, right? So. This is a long timeline. I think the commitment from all the partners, both in developing the EIS and you know, the memorandum of understanding between the, even though it's non-binding between the local governments is all, all that's important. We don't wanna lose that collaboration, but um, you know, so the trick I think is gonna be holding this together over the extended timeline and the sequencing of what we do. And then the funding will probably be in chunks based on that timing. Thank you. Thank that. you. And I think that there are ways that we can work together to figure out a strategy to keep the momentum going, um, but still moving this forward as the ports start working on the, the good things that they've got to do. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Ray Peters, do you have any comments?
Okay, well, we can come can back. Oh, oh, sorry yes. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got two, uh, I've got my computer going and then I had to use my phone to get the, get the uh, uh, sound going. No, I don't have anything to add other than I just appreciate the collaboration uh, that uh, the team has done, uh, funding a work group, uh, the executive team. It's been a long process. Uh, all the work that our consultants have done, uh, keeping us together and on track is fabulous. Uh, just want to point out Sam and the port taking a proactive approach to uh, the remediation that needs to occur that is really going to make this all possible. Um, and so going back to even the Rockland House uh, study uh, that stated that we needed to do something and doing nothing was not an alternative. <clears throat> Being able to vet through all that has been critical to get to this point. And I just appreciate uh, everybody's uh, good dialogue uh, concerns in coming to the uh, preferred alternative. Uh, thank you for uh, the work you've done, Carrie and Anne, as well. We still have a heavy lift, but we know uh, what the plan is and uh, it will be accomplished. Thank you, Ray. Uh, let's see. Um, go to Olympia. Jay. Thank you, Carrie. I just want to comment about, uh, I want to echo the comments about collaboration. <clears throat> this has been an amazing amount of work uh, to get to this point. Uh, it's an amazing amount of collaboration amongst all these jurisdictions. Uh, it's also very exciting to be at this point to, even though I think um, as Representative Theron just said, there's a lot of work left to do over a long period of time, but to be at this moment and to be part of being in this moment um, is awesome. And I, so I just wanna thank uh, everybody. I wanna specifically thank the DES team for all of your hard work, uh, for your stick togetherness on this, uh, for keeping us all moving in a good direction to get us to um, a resolution on a lot of things. Uh, I know this was taxing on all of you at uh, various points along the way, um, but I just wanna acknowledge you and thank you uh, for your work. So just happy to be at this moment. Thank you. Uh, Rich. Uh, thanks, Kerry. I'll echo Jay's comments. Um, you know, with regard to the MOU, um, we did a lot in a short amount of time. It exceeded my expectations, I will say. Um, and that, I attribute that to the team and the work that you did um, working with all of us. Uh, also, just briefly, um, I want to thank the team as well for hearing Olympia's concerns about the Fifth Avenue Bridge. Um, you know, that initially that was proposed to be, you know, a closure for four to five years, and that would have been an enormous impact for transportation connectivity in our community. And so we worked on that together, and I think we came up with a much better alternative all the way around. Uh, the final product will be much better, too. So. Um, so thanks for your work on that and hearing our concerns. I think we got to a better place. Thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Tom Water, Mary Sullivan. Uh, thank you. I want to echo all the comments. And this has just been a, a very fast paced, but very good process. And I think this is a model of how all of our communities can come together and working with all the different partners to come up with a, a good um, program and plan. Uh, again, it's going to be on all of us to keep this moving forward because this is a long process and, and people forget and people change new electeds, new managers. And so just making sure we can keep this moving forward uh, with the legacy into future um, uh, partners and make sure that this doesn't um, go by the wayside. So I wanna make sure that we move it forward. And Tom is very committed to making that happen. Thank you. Uh, uh, Council member Althauser. Thanks. I, I think our mayor said it very well. I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, Don. Right. Thank you. I would echo, yes, lots, 
lots left to do, but uh, lots of tremendous collaboration um, up to this point. And I would also do a shout out um, to our consultant team who has kept us steadily moving along and answering really complex and intertwined questions. And I, I don't actually feel a moment where we ever said, we don't have an answer to that. Like someone didn't answer it. So thank you, Tessa and Sarah and, and everybody from F Floyd Snyder. So appreciate that. And also Carrie uh, for keeping us moving along and for the leadership really from DES. When you think back to, you know, a, a prior head of DES who said and walked out on the limb and said, we have to find a solution to this. We can't, doing doing nothing is not an option. And so kudos to Chris and to everyone who's continued to move that ball forward. So thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, Thurston County, um, Jeff. Thank you. I mean, there isn't much I can, I can really add um, as far as the collaboration. I mean, this has just been amazing. I feel like we came together as a team and when you consider how many uh, organizations we come from, all with disparate goals, it really makes me proud of the community I've chosen, chosen to live in because this is incredible. Um, I do wish we were all meeting right now in person like we did in the before times, but you know, I, I get it. Uh, I just want to know, I want you all to know, I have really, really enjoyed working with you. I want to echo the comments about Floyd Snyder and Tessa. You guys are incredible. Thank you all so much. This has been cool to be a part of this. Thank you. Um, Tomasino, was there anything you'd like to, any comments you have? I'm quite sure that Commissioner Menser would say ditto to all of the remarks that have been shared. He's enjoyed this experience and looks forward to the next steps and values the work that has been done by all the community partners. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, lot. Matt. Thank you. Yeah, not not too much more to add. Just just a big thank you really to DES consultant team getting us here. Um, and just like Jeff said, it just makes me proud to be part of this community and what we can accomplish together. Uh, you know, thinking back five, 10 plus years about, is it Lake Estuary, Lake Estuary, this whole thing, and to be here now and really just like, would we really have thought we could even be here at that point five years ago? So thank you to everybody. Many thanks. Thank you. Justin? Thomasina stole my line. I was going to say ditto, but uh, just thank you to everyone. Uh, it's been uh, great to be part of this process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Port, Director Gibney. Hey, thank you. I, I'd also like to especially thank the consultant team and um, just an extraordinary job of herding cats. And um, I, I also like to, to really thank DES and the consultant team. One of the things I, I appreciated about some of the challenges of, of this is trying to define the scope of, the, of this project. And, um, and that was always kind of a, a cumbersome thing. And I think that we have landed on a really elegant solution that, that is um, the recognition of that the dredging in uh, West Bay and all of the accessory habitat improvements and things that, that can come from that, that does need to go first. And it does kind of have its own separate scope. And yet it is it is joint and, and, and somewhat part and parcel of, of this project. And I think that we really landed on a very elegant solution. And there were a lot of people that helped to articulate that. So um, um, I'd also like to recognize the really extraordinary nature of this collaboration of I don't know of uh, really any other collaboration that involves a sovereign nation, a state, and, and, and many of its agencies, um, the um, municipalities, utilities, a port district that is addressing both a, a, a waterway and navigation issue, as well as um, habitat restoration, addressing sea level rise, and providing for the stewardship of a, a working waterfront and recreation waterfront along um, as well, that balance of economic development and environmental stewardship. 
th this is truly an extraordinary collaboration that um, I think that um, uh, people will be writing about us <laughs> uh, and, and how we, so now it's time to roll up our sleeves and actually um, get the work done. It is a, in the world of uh, dredging and, and cleanup, what we're proposing is a, it, while there's a lot of work to be done and it's extended timeline, it is also lightning speed <laughs> in, in that world. So it is, um, it is an ambitious timeline. And I think that uh, everyone here on this call and all of our community partners, we're going to need to stay engaged, keep this moving forward and um, look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Uh, and Alex. <laughs> yeah, I think so much has already been said, but I will say um, I last touched this uh, briefly about 12 years ago and or 10 years ago, I think. And to get from where that was, where it was clear people were staking out positions and kind of hunkering down to where we are today is really a testament to DES and the consultant team for really doing, a, a investing in a, a meaningful stakeholder process and having the conversations and letting people, listening to everybody's interests, I think we wouldn't be here without that. So uh, huge, kudos, huge kudos to all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Okay, is there anyone I missed or anyone else have any other comments? I have comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I agree with everything that everybody has said, but also especially that this is such a model for an amazing collaboration and coordination amongst all these different municipalities and especially um, also including the tribes. Tessa, you are incredible. Um, I don't know, the consultant team is amazing, but Tessa, you have been such an anchor and, and carry the same as you as well. I don't know how we would get there without you. And I also want to highlight that, oh, this is such a legacy for all of us and, and it will continue to be a legacy, but Carrie is going to be leaving us in retirement. So I just want to celebrate Carrie for her public service, for being a part of this project for all of these years. Amazing. I don't know what we're going to do without you. <laughs> there is nobody who's going to be able to replace you, but you are an incredible public servant. And we're going to miss you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, it's just been a a amazing project to finish my career and I've been so lucky to work with all of you. So thank you. Okay. Um, well, then with that, um, Kim, would you check and see if we have any public comments? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending today. And uh, at this point, I'd like to be able to open up and welcome the public to be able to provide any comment that they wish to provide um, for this group. Uh, if you would like to be able to provide a comment, we are asking that you limit your comments only two or three minutes, so that way everybody has an opportunity to speak today. And if you'd like to be able to make a comment, please just use the raise your hand feature and we will remove your, uh, your microphone's mute. Okay, see we have David Peeler. Kristen, can you take off his mute? Mute. Well, thank you, Kim. This is Dave Peeler uh, with the Desuch S-ray Restoration Team. We've been following this issue, working on it for about 15 years now. And like the others have said today, it's incredible to be at this point today. <clears throat> it's almost overwhelming in a lot of ways, you know, because it's been such an issue for such a long time. And the the uh, work that was done by DES and the others, including those who are signing on to the funding and governance agreement, those those entities, as well as the uh, consultant team, has been fantastic. That's way. That's the best way to describe it to me. I do have a question for Carrie, though, now that she's going out the door. What's the, what's the scale of the budget request that you're requesting for this time around? And have you put together potential budget requests for the next several years as, as this work unfolds? Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> we um, DES had put in a placeholder request um, because um, we needed to um, 
to consider the decision. And, and we had a, a time period after the final EIS came out um, in which to um, make that decision and issue a notice of action taken. Um, the budget request, I think it's about $17 million for design and permitting. Um, as far as um, the construction beyond that, um, we have um, planning level costs and those are uh, in the EIS and you can look those up. But um, as I think I said before, those um, construction costs will continue to be fine tuned as we move into final uh, design. So, so more on that to come. Thank you, Carrie. Uh -huh. Thank you, David. Is there anybody else from the public that would like to provide a comment? Okay, Carrie, it doesn't look like there's anybody else. Okay. All right. Um, let's see, my screen, I've got too many things on here. All right. I would just like to uh, reiterate what Anne said at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, your partnership in this process has been so critical in getting us to this milestone. Uh, we appreciate what each of you has brought to the EIS process and thank you for well, your time, your input, your energy toward completing this work. And as everyone has said, the amazing collaboration. We appreciate each of your contributions and we look forward to continued coordination as this project moves ahead. Um, so thank you. It's been a pleasure to work with all of you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Congratulations, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye. Take care.